Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, my name is Michael Crum. Um, I'm Professor French here uh, in Trinity College Dublin and Director of the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural uh, Translation. So I'm delighted to welcome you here uh, to the latest seminar in the series on uh, Trinity and the Changing uh, City. Um, so this uh, evening, uh, my guests are going to discuss uh, the topic of uh, Dublin's uh, languages. Uh, and one of the things that occurred to me uh, earlier on as I was watching the, the rainfall um, is the, 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 the first page, uh, probably the most familiar page to most readers of Finnegan's Wake, um, because they tend to lose hope and then as they go a little further through the, uh, the book. Um, but there's that kind of famous uh, moment when there's the, uh, the clap <laughs> of thunder that goes babble gargar tagan mruk kum taner ron tun drun vara huna wonka on tu hun or the on toronok, which is the clap of thunder uh, in more than uh, 10 uh, languages, which include uh, Japanese, uh, Hindi, French, uh, Danish, uh, Irish, Swedish, and Italian. Uh, but it seems to me that to some extent the kind of polyglot city. Um, that uh, Joyce was kind of imagining uh, in his, his work here in the opening pages of Finnegan's Wake is the city that has become a polyglot reality as opposed to a kind of polyglot uh, dream or, or, or vision. Um, and this is in a city where the figures vary uh, on this, and I'm sure our speakers would be able to offer some um, background information on this, but some people claim it's up to 160 languages now in the city of Dublin, it's quite common to have schools. Uh, where uh, among the school enrolments there will be up to 30 uh, mother tongues and more uh, in the case of the students uh, attending uh, the school. Uh, for anybody who travels uh, on the Lewis, uh, the Dart, uh, the bus service in Dublin, um, you really get the sensation uh, that you're travelling uh, through language, through uh, linguistic uh, diversity. So it's very much the idea that Dublin has become a kind of translation uh, zone as you travel through uh, these different uh, languages and their associated uh, cultures. Of course, one of the things um, that has happened in more recent times is that policymakers have very belatedly uh, begun to pay attention to this linguistic uh, diversity. The, the first language policy in the history of the state that came out last year, Languages Connect, uh, talks about uh, or recognises the presence of migrant uh, languages uh, in, uh, in Ireland uh, and the need to think about them in terms of uh, how we might plan for language education uh, in our schools. Uh, Jan Blomert, uh, the uh, Belgian sociolinguist, talks about um, the fact that in our cities, uh, where as at one particular point it was kind of a notion that cities would lead to linguistic homogeneity with the emergence of dominant major languages, but in fact the opposite has happened. But he, he talks about linguistic super diversity, that our, our cities are becoming more and more uh, linguistically uh, complex. Um, and uh, Alistair Pennycook and uh, Emil Tsuji, uh, in a book from 2015, have coined this term metrolingualism uh, to describe the way in which uh, people in cities have increasingly have a kind of language repertoire. And they're using different kinds of languages uh, for different kinds of interactions uh, with people. A particular example they look at are restaurants uh, in, in Sydney, uh, the markets and so on, and how people are using uh, these different languages and negotiating their interactions uh, with others uh, using these uh, different uh, languages. Um, so I think there's a great deal uh, to talk about uh, this evening. Um, so I just want to briefly uh, introduce uh, our three uh, panellists. Um, so, uh, Beginning with uh, Dr. Francesca Lamorchia, uh, who is an assistant professor here in uh, the School of uh, Clinical Speech and uh, Language uh, Studies. Uh, Francesca has a particular uh, interest in child language development and child uh, bilingualism, uh, and has recently published with Oxford University Press uh, a document looking at the role of uh, first language in uh, English medium uh, instruction. Um, Besides uh, <coughs> Dr. Amorgia. Uh, Dr. Rory uh, McDade is joining us here uh, from uh, the Marino Institute of Education, where he's a lecturer in sociology of education and research methods, he's also visiting research fellow in the School of Education here in Trinity College Dublin. Uh, more pointedly in terms of um, what we'll be discussing tonight, he's the coordinator of the Migrant uh, Teacher uh, Project, and he's widely published on questions of language, uh, culture and identity in the case of migrant uh, children. Um, and the, uh, our next panellist is 
uh, Ola Machkadumi, uh, who is an MA student in digital uh, broadcasting in uh, IADT, um, who is uh, an accomplished speaker of Yoruba, uh, English and uh, Irish. And for those of us who were privileged a number of weeks ago uh, to listen to uh, Ola speaking at the end of an event uh, on the Irish language translation of Chinua Cheve's uh, Things uh, Fall Apart, um, Ola gave uh, an extremely uh, eloquent uh, testimony as to the, uh, the influence uh, of Sean Laurier Dawn's um, uh, writings on her thinking about uh, language, uh, culture uh, and identity, and this was done entirely uh, as well. Uh, so, um, without further ado then, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you to Daniel and, and to Tom for the invite to, to come in and speak tonight. I met Tom last Saturday morning and he reminded me 12 minutes. Or 12 minutes. Um, so what I have done to, to try to keep to that time is, to, is, is commit what I have to paper to, to make sure I don't go off on, on the tangents that I will do. But uh, you can give me a nod if I, if I, if I digress too far. Um, so... Um, by many measures, Ireland is a highly globalised country. The, the Vice Provost of Trinity himself, Chris Marash, spoke on that topic here quite recently um, when he highlighted that Ireland was consistently one of the most globalised countries in the world since the turn of the century. The latest globalisation index for 20, 2018, which refers to an Ireland of 2016, now positions Ireland as 15th, so we're slipping down that ranking. But in terms of uh, economic globalisation, we're still positioned as 6th, and in terms of social globalisation, we're still positioned as ninth, or 67th for political globalisation. Um, I often start off with this kind of exploration with my students when I'm working around issues of language diversity, uh, immigration into Ireland, and ethnic diversity, because it provides a really important context to, you know, through which we can examine contemporary Ireland. When looking at tonight's topic around Dublin's languages and, and, and the growing linguistic diversity of the city, this is particularly apt. We know that Ireland has become home to uh, immigrants from over 200 uh, countries in the last 20, 25 years, and we are now beginning to witness the second generation of that migration, uh, in, and particularly in certain pockets in the city and outside of the city. Migration and linguistic diversity very often goes hand in hand, and this is strongly the case in present-day Dublin. Um, speaking two languages, and I think we don't hear this and, and think about this often enough, speaking two or more languages is actually normal in the world. Okay, and I think just normalising that notion of multilingualism is particularly important. Jim Cummins would talk about close on maybe two-thirds of the world's children grow up in bilingual or multilingual environments. Closer to home, uh, the Euro uh, barometer, which looked at Europeans and their languages in 2012, told us that 54% of residents within the, European, within the European Union were able to hold a conversation in one additional language other than their mother tongue. If we go down a little bit further, with 25% who were able to hold that conversation in two languages plus their mother tongue, and that drops, but still a high enough percentage of 10% will be conversant in at least three plus mother tongue. Okay. Interestingly as well, I think 84% agree that, of that population agree that everyone in the European Union should be able to speak at least one foreign language in addition to their mother tongue. Percentage for Ireland? 
No, Hulk, who's it for? <laughs> 40. Okay. So in 2012, 40% was somewhere, I think the, the sample was about 1,060, were able to hold a conversation in one additional language other than their mother tongue um, um, in Ireland. If we come a little bit closer then and, and, and look at what data we have available to us in the context of Ireland, um, nationally, the 2016 census provides us with data that somewhere in the region of 13, 12.85% of residents were able to speak a language other than Irish or English at home. Now, I suppose if we look at the increase, the percentage increase since 2011 when that question was first asked on the census, we see that there's, a rate, that there's, there's an increase of 19% from 2011 to 2016 on that. And the most common languages that are spoken at homes in Ireland outside of Irish and English are Polish, Lithuanian, Romanian and Portuguese. Now, that I suppose paints a national picture. What I think is important in the context of the, 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 the lecture tonight or, or the address tonight, when we look at Dublin City, we see an overall population of, so within the city boundaries, the census tells us 554,554 people in 2016. So a nice ring to that. Of those, 96,000 people indicated that they speak a language other than Irish or English at home. That's about 17.4% of the population that was uh, of usual residents in, uh, on, on the night of, of, of census. So 17.4% speak a language other than Irish or English at home. If we uh, kind of examine that a little bit deeper, we, we, we'll spread out from Dublin City out, out across Dublin County. Dublin City comes in at 17.4%. Fingal will come in at 22.5%. South Dublin at 17.3%. And the Lira Rath down at 14.1%. You can question why, why those... Uh, Differences exist, but overall we're sitting somewhere in a population of Dublin County of close on 18% of people who speak a language other than Irish or English at home. That's almost one in every five people. So it's no, uh, it's no surprise when we're alerted to the fact that when we sit on the bus or when we sit on the Lewis or the Dart, we are, we are, we are living in a multilingual environment and we see that and we hear that. The unequal distributions uh, that I've noted within, the, uh, within Dublin County, uh, if, if, if we look at those more deeply into the electoral divisions within each of the, uh, the, 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 the four of these, for example, R and Key, it, it, it again gives us a very kind of um, unequal distribution. Of, of, language, of, of language speakers in certain areas within the city. So in Aaron Key C, which is an electoral division within Dublin City, 37% of people resident uh, were speaking a language other than Irish or English uh, on the night of the, of the census. If you look at Fingal, which you know, works off at 22.5% in general, uh, Blanchardstown Mulhuddard electoral division, 46%, so almost half of people living in that electoral mm -hmm. division spoke a language other than English or Irish uh, as, as a language at home. Now, we can't be absolutely clear about how often these languages are being spoken, because that question isn't asked on the census, but I think we can establish, you know, we can be fairly confident that it's, uh, that it's a fairly regular occurrence. The language, the question on the Irish language in the census does ask about how often the language is spoken. And you know the, the, there are more statistics available than what I'm going to show here, but 29.2% um, of the population of Dublin City identify as Irish speakers, but if we hold for the non-stated population, that rises to close on 40%, who identify as Irish speakers. If we dig into those data a little bit, though, what we begin to see is a, a population of 7.4% of the population of the city that speak Irish daily within the education system only, and only 3.3% of the population of the city speak Irish at least once a week outside of the education system. Uh, that drops down then to 7.8% of Irish speakers who never speak Irish outside of the education system. So I suppose what I'm painting here is a picture somewhat of a multilingual city. Now multilingualism is at the same time it's, a, it's an individual as well as a social 
phenomenon. And it's something that kind of transgresses or, or is encountered across all sections within society, social classes, ages, and across countries. We know, uh, and, and research is, is quite strong on this in terms of the, the list of benefits for the individual speaker, in terms of multilingual uh, um, uh, awareness, uh, mesolinguistic awareness, um, ability to, to, to notice um, uh, grammatical errors, etc. Um, but in addition to that, when we think about some of the other benefits, some interesting work coming out of London uh, quite recently, looking at young, young multilingual teenagers and, and, and be more empathetic and be more open-minded than some of their monolingual peers. So, as an ever-increasing feature of the fabric of society, we hear, it on a, we hear it and read it on our streets, we hear it in our religious services, we hear it in our health services, we hear it in our shops, our public transport, our restaurants and our bars, we hear it in our educational institutions. Uh, the Dean of Research here in Trinity Linda Doyle has, has recently tweeted that there are now 80, uh, 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 people from 83 different nationalities uh, enrolled on postgraduate courses in the university. So Trinity itself is contributing to this, and education and third level education is contributing to this by actively recruiting from abroad. Okay? Adding to that rich linguistic repertoire of the city. My own, uh, my own research work examines facets of multilingualism in our schools and our school communities. And I suppose I want to emphasise again here the, that multilingualism within so many Irish schools, in addition to the bilingualism of Irish and English, but multilingualism within so many of Irish schools is normal. Okay. Schools, many schools that have been built since the early 2000s have not known any other reality other than a multilingual reality. Many schools, particularly in Dublin City, have, over the last 20 years, been serving a population that is very multilingual and have not known any other reality than that. So it is very normal for our schools to be working in that environment. Um, just by way of illustration, one of my postgraduate students is a, is a teacher in a school not, not two kilometres away from here, and this year, of less than 250 students, we have speakers of 39 different languages enrolled in that school. Um, even closer than that school, the City of Dublin Education Training Board and their Migrant Access Programme, which works with young uh, migrants into the city between 13 and 18, refugees, unaccompanied minors, etc. Um, I'm currently doing an evaluation of a project in there, and, and, and when you go in and work with some of the teachers and listen to some of the languages, you see almost changing the, the linguistic structures of the city as you see Eritrean people coming in, then Somali people, then uh, Afghan people, and then uh, uh, Syrian people. And, and, and listening and observing and hearing those languages, you, you are living the, the, the shifting linguistic uh, reality of the city. Um, and what they're bringing with them is not just their languages, but also their linguistic practices. So in terms of their internet usage, their online, their, their, their phone tests, their, uh, text messages, etc., you're seeing a very different type of linguistic practices that is embedded in multilingual reality. There are challenges with this reality, but there's also great learning opportunities. The primary school I mentioned um, uh, earlier, um, the, 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 the resources that children are providing, both for, the, uh, for all the children in the school, but also for the teachers in terms of understanding how languages work, and the teachers will reflect on that, they become a very strong language teachers by virtue of working with populations who demand that, and who are living uh, um, through a number of different languages. That school as well is really well supported by outside agencies. And just by way of example, you have an embassy working in that school providing first language tuition for children after school. You have an NGO that's providing help around uh, translation and interpretation services for family and community members. Okay? You have the children themselves engaged in a, a really exciting project, a, a young uh, translators project, where older and more proficient speakers of a language are working with younger uh, or linguistically aligned pupils newer to the school to help them and to integrate through their languages. Not seeing language as a problem, but seeing it as a resource. There's a real vibrancy when you get in around that school and you just hear uh, and, and, and you sit and, and listen and watch. The issue of translation and interpretation, which I've mentioned there that an NGO is providing, is um, in the early 2000s, we noticed 
in, in a lot of schools, in, particularly in the inner city and, and, and the school that I was working in, it was very difficult to access properly trained interpreters and to have them available to come in and work with parents, members of the community, children and staff within schools. Um, pilot project in the North Inner City, which was evaluated in 2008, uh, uh, the, the school's culture mediation project, uh, no, that, uh, which worked to provide translation and interpretation services for schools in the, in, in, in the North Inner City, was a really transformative piece. And I just want to read a, a quotation from a principal who was part of the project. So 10 schools in the North Inner City who had access to translation and interpretation services through the, the SCMP. So this principal is talking about the importance of parental involvement and, and, and offers us the following. The experience of a parent crying at a parent-teacher meet where they were assisted by an interpreter. They were crying with this sense of relief that for the first time the parent could ask questions and discuss her child's progress with the teacher. That is a clear indication of that parent's sense of involvement in the school that was facilitated by the Culture Mediation Project. So we know that linguistic diversity can be a challenge both for society and the institutions within that society. From my point of view, it's for the speakers of those languages as well that it can be a challenge. When a society or a city does not fully grasp the importance of providing the services to those speakers and to those institutions, when we slip into a language as problem understanding or perspective, when we set up language power dynamics that ask young children to defend the linguistic practices of their parents, or worse, that actually put them at odds with the linguistic practices of their parents, where we encourage them to move away from the language practices of their parents, then we are really doing a disservice to, uh, well, to, 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 to the reams of, of research that, that encourages us to, to, to do something different, but actually just to the not understanding the relationships within families at a very basic level. We know from international studies, we haven't a huge amount of it yet here in Ireland, but international studies where this is to be the case, you look in a family breakdown, grandparents unable to communicate with grandchildren, and all the problems that go with that. Um, so the challenge here, I suppose, is, Alvarez would point out, that we need to understand bilingualism as additive, not just for the languages that have an economic benefit, but for all languages. I think maybe that's where I leave it and, and I move on to uh, Ella Francesca to, to take it up from there. Is that okay? perspectives that we can discuss and I think we are all aware that Dublin is a multilingual city and that these languages have come from somewhere so they are a representation of a worldview like each language in the world represents uh, one viewpoint and one way of looking at the world but for people who speak these languages there's a lot more to it there is a sense of identity there's a sense of having built a relationship through the language. And Rory spoke about migrant languages. And in a way, um, recently I was asked, is it, is it okay if I call you a migrant woman? Um, they, they were, they were going to introduce me and they said, well, uh, someone said, is it okay if I call you doctor? I said, yeah, doctor is okay. Uh, <laughs> not GP doctor, but, um, but is it okay if I call you a migrant woman? And I never thought of myself now as a migrant woman, even though I lived in Italy until I was 22, and then I moved here uh, only last year. And um, so um, these migrant languages may have originated elsewhere. So, of course, I used to speak Italian when I was a child, I moved here, and I brought my language with me. And when I brought my language with me, I brought my history, I brought all of my past and my relationships that I built through that language. And I value that, and I always did. And maybe more, the older I get, the more I value um, my knowledge of my language and also my ability to communicate to people with this language. Um, but really, there's a point where these migrant languages become Dublin's languages. So they, they have moved from somewhere, but they belong here now. 
and that is very much the case of children who grew up in Dublin uh, in many schools, like the school that Rory was talking about, which I visited, and it's an amazing school, and I'll show you a picture from that school later. Um, but that language becomes part of the uh, repertoire of these children who are Irish children. So they grow up here, they go to school here, as everybody else, but they have an extra gift, which is the language of their heritage. It's a language that their parents have passed on to them. So it's what we call in research a heritage language. So a heritage language is the language that parents transmit onto their children, or usually parents, pass on to their children in a context where the language is not spoken outside the home. Um, and why this is important is that we need to realise that these languages belong here and that bilingual children are, as Rory was saying, they're the norm. They speak two languages that are almost, you know, they're belonging to who we are as a society now. So as a society, we need to embrace this multilingualism. Multilingualism and bilingualism in individuals is something quite normal. It's part of the experience of more and more children who are growing up here, going to preschools before they go to school even. You know, there are preschools that are extremely multicultural and multilingual, and we need to acknowledge that. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention in relation to this, I've briefly mentioned the issue of identity. Um, and when we think of children, uh, they are obviously very much influenced by whoever is around them. So it could be their family, it could be their friends, it could be their uh, community. And I've worked a lot with parents who are raised, who are raising bilingual, trilingual, plurilingual children, and they have concerns. So raising a bilingual child in Dublin is not the most straightforward, plain sailing. Uh, you may have heard the children are like sponges kind of thing. Yes, children learn everything very fast, but language does take time to acquire, and it takes a lot of input and exposure and opportunities to use the language. So um, uh, parents, sometimes they're scared themselves, even though they may say, well, Italian is my language, I really care about it, but it's a lot of work to pass it on to my children. And uh, the same goes for Irish and for any language. Um, but also sometimes parents come with a negative attitude towards their first language and a very positive attitude towards English. So they might believe that English is the more powerful language, is also the more useful language, and for a lot of smaller language groups, like for example Dutch speakers or Swedish speakers in Dublin, they find that the community is so small that it, and the, 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 their families might have very good proficiency in English, that it becomes really, really difficult to keep up this language. Um, so in a way, uh, we think that parents are the ones responsible for uh, developing bilingualism and multilingualism in children, but in reality there's a lot more to it. There's an entire society uh, and that includes in the, our neighbours, I'm thinking of our neighbours, and the, the school community, the uh, friends. And the attitudes are something that we pick up very quickly. Okay? When my child went to school for the first time, junior infants, the first thing, I was speaking Italian to her, and the teacher said, oh, what language do you speak? And she said Italian. Oh, I was in Italy only last week. And she thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, she was extremely enthusiastic about the fact that he shared a similar experience to hers. She was also just back from Italy. He spoke a couple of words in Italian and she was extremely proud of this. And that's something that links them, you know, it creates a relationship between them. And that doesn't apply to every language. So there are some more prestigious languages, there are some languages that you might have heard of before, you might relate to, there's other languages that you've never heard before. So even the teacher has a role the neighbour has a role, the friend has a role in saying every bilingual is amazing, every language you speak. It doesn't matter how famous it is, it doesn't matter how people sometimes go easy, difficult, there's no difficult language for children when it's their parents' language. But society is responsible for um, making parents aware that they are doing um, a service to the child by raising them bilingually and by exposing them to more than one language. Um, parents, as I said, come with their own attitudes and others play another very important role and it's not only society but it's also the people who care for children at the very early stages. And these might be GPs, uh, early childhood educators, public health nurses and these, and 
you know, uh, educators and teachers, these are adults that parents trust very much. So if they're telling you, stop speaking your mother tongue to your child, parents will follow that advice. And that is still happening because I hear reports regularly of parents being told not to speak their native language to their children or to keep it in the home. So yes, it's okay, it's your family language, but try and practice a few words of English every day. But that's not really, and I'm sure you're all here in tune with what I'm saying, but um, that's not a multilingual view, that's a monolingual view of how we should raise children. You know, you should be doing really well in English, and then if you can cope with the other language, fine, but English is the priority. And that is a misconception because bilingual children and multilingual children, they, they can cope with as many languages, they can learn them, and they don't know them all equally well at every stage of their life. And from the point of view of ourselves as researchers, but also as um, you know, members of the community, we need to know that being bilingual or multilingual doesn't mean that you're perfect in each of your languages. And once we get away with, you know, once we understand that perfection is not what we're aiming for, um, I think it relaxes everybody. Um, the other thing that I, um, well, moving from the home and the, the advice given by uh, professionals, um, let me see why. Okay, I, I think teachers also have a very important role, and I mentioned one example, uh, but I worked in, well, the school that Rory mentions. Uh, I visited 11 of those classes and, uh, and also in another inner city school. And the type of, of activities that I did with the children included talking about language. And everybody enjoys talking about language one way or another. Not only uh, children who have heritage languages, but every child has some language knowledge of English, of Irish, of uh, sometimes children mention languages they learn from books, like made up languages. Uh, so languages are like codes and then you can play with them. But what all these activities um, were very much geared towards understanding that we're living in a multilingual world. So I asked the children to bring in objects from the home that had other languages on them. Very, very easy. If you look at the packaging for the freezer bags, that has translations and it tells you, uh, do not put in the oven because it will melt, and it tells you in at least 15 different languages, it's, if it's from Lidl or somewhere like that. Um, but also children had books and they had a lot of objects, like their crayons, they had instructions in different languages. Uh, and what it, this did was definitely not teaching them new words. Um, they, we did a bit of that in class, but it was teaching them that different languages are everywhere and we need to be open to them. We listened to the radio. And uh, I found it interesting what Rory was saying about the languages that we hear on the bus. Um, when I put on either the radio or recordings of cartoons in Swahili sometimes, in Italian, in Portuguese, in Hindi, um, children may have known the languages and they were like, oh, that's me, that's me. Anna, how do you know that's your, that, that language? Because I know. And but what, how do you know? I just know, the children would say, and that was their parents' language. And uh, for the very young children, they couldn't figure out why they knew, I just know. Um, but for, in a lot of classes, when we were listening to Russian, and there was no Russian speaker in the class, and I would say, okay, let's guess. And most children would guess Polish. And when it was Italian, and I'd say, okay, guess this one, in the same class, they would guess another Romance language that sounds like Italian or Spanish. How do they know this? They know this from the bus. They, they, their parents haven't taught them that Italian sounds like that and same as Spanish. These were five-year-olds, four-year-olds. They've heard these languages and they are tuned into their differences and maybe they have been on holidays somewhere. But this kind of knowledge that we have of linguistic diversity comes from our experience. Um, and one picture that I wanted to show you was an activity we did there you go. With some of, um, can you see that? Yeah. And so this was one of the activities and involved um, drawing the multilingual city. So this is Dublin one uh, to them. Uh, there were pictures that we brought of the immediate surroundings of the school. <coughs> some ch they chose to use them, some didn't. Um, it's not 
let me see how well you can see a bit better. And so you see shops. All the shops are labelled with a name that the students chose in whatever language they wanted. Mm -hmm. A lot of just shops seem to be, um, what's that horrible place called? Anyway, I can't say in one video. Um, but children are into this stationary thing that is very <laughs> smelly. Um, so a lot of shops were, yes, my God. Um, <laughs> yeah, smelly stationary. Uh, but they had cinema, Moldova, which is probably the shop where they buy food, and they had a few, there was a few mention of um, Moldovan uh, here and there, gelato, and so you can see, <coughs> this is the work of only three students in the space of an hour, or a bit more, and there's a lot of hashtags as well, and that's how we communicate now. And there's words like beautiful, Brazil, have a great, drink, have a great day, and then tenho un ottimo dia. And they were able to express themselves in the languages that they wanted to use. So they chose to use English because it was an option. They chose to use Portuguese. They chose to use, um, I think there's a bit more, there's Irish there, there's hashtag Irish. And, um, <coughs> but also there's a few words here and there of, um, in Irish as well. So these three pupils, between them, have six languages, uh, five or six languages, and they can use them in a creative way. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking to see bilingualism, multilingualism, as a way to express creativity, to express a sense of identity that is not necessarily a migrant identity. It's the new Irish multilingual identity. And we can work on this with teachers, with parents, with our local community, to strengthen this idea that multilingualism is not a deficit, it's actually something that is going to enrich. And it is already enriching our society, we just need to foster it and use it as a resource. So, that's me. I'd like to greet you in three languages that I'm very familiar with, Ekrole, Div, and Good Evening. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. I have to say it's an honour to be here to discuss Dublin languages. Thank you very much, Tom, for inviting me. So, as um, Francesca and Lauren were talking about the multilingualism, multilingualism in Dublin, we can't talk about Dublin languages without discussing the multiculturalism of the city and how that evolved. So Dublin has changed tremendously as a city over the last 20 years. The peak of inward migration into Ireland in general was the late 90s when me and my parents came. There's different languages heard throughout the city centre. I love hearing my own mother's tongue throughout the city centre in Europe. It's just, it makes me feel very at home and you know I kind of can't think oh I know what you're saying. <laughs> And yeah, different languages are usually heard throughout the city centre. It's just beautiful to see the multiculturalism of Ireland today. In April 2016, there were 535,475 non-Irish nationals living in Ireland. Ten nationalities accounted for 70% of the total figure from the Central Statistics Office. So I'm going to just talk a bit about my background, how I got into the Irish language. So I went to primary school in Glasgow, Listenog. I went to Glasgow, Listenog because we were living, me and my parents were living down the road from, uh, from the school in Ranla. And my dad just kind of thought it would be like a great adventure to just put me in an all Irish school to just see how it goes, you know. But I think it was kind of a gamble in a way because, you know, that was the year 2000 and that was the peak of inward migration. So, you know, it was kind of risk in the sense that like it might have been, seemed a bit strange for someone from an immigrant background to go to an all Irish school. But that wasn't the case at all. Uh, well, School is to really took me in and took other people of different backgrounds in. It was a very multicultural school and it still is to this day. Um, we would always celebrate different cultures. My class would usually celebrate Nigeria because there's another Nigeria girl 
in my class at the time as well. So yeah, it was a great school. And then I went on to Clash to Isagon, and that's really where my passion for the Irish language kicked in. Uh, like I say always, um, Phil Arish by Sean O'Reardon was the poem that really got me inspired. And I studied that in fifth and sixth year for my leaving cert, and that poem just really spoke to me, and I'll be talking about that later on. And now I'm currently a volunteer radio presenter on Radio Nalipa. I've been working there for almost five years. And it's really a great experience. I would love to work in the media professionally. And it's just a great way to kind of get you into radio, the media, Irish, uh, Irish language media in general. So it's great fun and I'd recommend it to anyone. And Sail the Gwelga as well. Um, I'm very heavily involved in Sail the Gwelga, Irish language life. Um, with Radio Nalipa, I've been to external, external broadcasts at the Oireachtas, Fáil in the Galley in Rakhine, Gwaltuk Rakhine, and Pop of Gwaltuk as well is great, uh, that's all in Dublin and all around the world actually, it's really just gone up all around and it's actually on tomorrow if anyone wants to go. And also I was doing an international Women's Day interview for RTE with a RTE broadcaster, Blodid Me Coffee. And we were talking about, you know, being a woman, being an Irish speaker, those two minority backgrounds. And it's not an official video that went out, but we were discussing the burden of being a minority. And I said that I have two burdens, that I'm black and I'm a woman. And then she mentioned, you know, being an Irish speaker is also a burden, as it is a minority language. So... It's banned up made like Welga. I'm a minority within a minority community speaking a minority language. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot to it. But I have to say, you know, it is a really beautiful thing at the same time because it is unique. <clears throat> so my Nigerian heritage, I'm gonna speak a bit about that. So there's three main indigenous languages in Nigeria, Igbo, Hausa, and Yoruba. Uh, however, English is the official language as Nigeria was colonised by the British and got independence in the year 1960. There are over 500 languages in Nigeria. My mother's tongue is Yoruba, as I was saying. And I became familiar with the language from hearing it at home, from hearing my parents speak it, from hearing my siblings speak it, my sister and my brothers, and watching Nollywood. Films. I don't know if anyone here has watched Nollywood films, but um, I particularly love Yoruba and Nollywood films, they're great. <laughs> and it's just, Yoruba as a language is very rich and expressive. You know, when people speak Yoruba, they're really like, a lot of hand gestures, like, you can't just speak it, like, just, you know, kind of quietly, casually, like, you have to, you have to put hand gestures in it, like, any Nigerian knows that. <laughs> and um, the meaning of my own full name, Alufemi Warala um, Majekodumi. The meaning of names is very important in Yoruba culture and society. Most Yoruba names are unisex. And um, my first name, Alufemi, means God loves me. And then Warala, my middle name, means precious of wealth. And then Majekodumi means don't let it hurt me. So there's a lot, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so the thing is also. A lot of most Yoruba names have like spiritual and religious meaning as well. And I don't use my first name as my main name. Uh, I use my middle name, Warala, Ola for short. And my parents felt that Alufemi was mainly like a boy's name. And so they decided to go for Warala for me, which is an ancient Yoruba name and also a girl's name as well. But as I say, most Yoruba names are mostly unisex. And the language is quite uh, gender neutral, I have to say. Uh, there's no like she, he, her, him in the language. There's no gendered words for siblings, like brother, sister. There's just younger sibling, older sibling. So therefore the language might be seen as more progressive by some. However, there are, you can't say gender for like older sibling and younger sibling. So for example, Egbomi Okari, that means my older brother. Aburami Obiri, that means my younger sister. So, according to the 2011 census, there are 17,642 
resident Nigerians in Ireland. Nigerians constitute the largest African group in Ireland. Uh, one in five people, black people in the world are Nigerian. And my, I also have a love for Nigerian writers and activists as well, such as Shinua Shebe, Wole Shoinka, Chimamanda Ulusi Dichi, Ijoma Ombuinio. They're just such great writers and they're known internationally as well. So it's really a pride for me to see them doing well and I get a lot of inspiration from them. So here I come to Pilarish. Um, this is a very important poem to me. Uh, as I was saying, that that's what got me so passionate about the Irish language. Uh, I just want to say a few, read out some of the lines from the poem. So, Fog glan lindaut her, Fillery share the quidge, Need the ancient is need the kyanga, A good kangota it go rare of, Be bionus kyun le derum, Den eastern is den shiachan le de gilin feinig. I found those lines very powerful because what Charlotte Reardon was saying, and some might see this as atomistic, but I see it as a powerful poem saying, if we were in pre-colonised, pre if we go back to pre-colonised Ireland, we'd all be speaking Irish. And it was a dream, it was an Ashling, because we can't go back to that. But it's just the passion in the poem is what really got to me. And as I was saying, that's what made me kind of think of my own mother's tongue, Yoruba, and how even in Nigeria, some people see it as more civilised to speak English. Um, I'll mention a little anecdote, like my sister even, uh, living in Nigeria, she didn't teach her eldest daughter Yoruba at first. Um, so there is this belief like in Nigeria that it's more civilised to speak English. But like, I was even saying to my mom, like, why, why isn't she teaching Koyasala? You know, you're about like why? Like they live in Nigeria, like why not? Like I don't understand. So for me, I just think we need to kind of stop thinking that the culture and the language of the colonizer is somehow better. You know, this is essentially what Ogunbi Matianga talks about in this essay. He writes how language communicates the culture of its users. Language is the carrier of culture. Language is inseparable from ourselves as a community of human beings with a specific form and character, a specific history, a specific relationship with the world. So Ngugi Watiago was someone I heavily studied in my undergraduate English Media and Cultural Studies and he talks a lot about decolonizing the mind and I think that's really what Philary Shonarirdon was talking about, that we should respect our minority languages and we should keep them with us because they're also important. And it's shocked in the weather this week as well, and so was last week. Um, I don't know if anyone was watching Nationwide last night, but uh, as part of Shocked in the Belga, I was on it and I was talking about my story with the Irish language. So, yeah, there's a lot of events going on for Shocked in the Belga, but for Shocked in the Belga, I somehow feel like, you know, every week should be Irish week shouldn't just be two weeks because this is Ireland and we should be celebrating language all the time. Blina Guelga was a huge success last year as well. So, and Octolish also by Andran Dark, uh, that's up north, it advocates for the Irish Language Act up north. And I have a huge respect for Irish language speakers up north because it's a struggle for them to have the right to speak their language every day in their own country. So I find that very admirable. And I'll show you a logo of the Fania, which is the logo for Dram Dara for, um, for Octolish. And also Brian Field's translation play, uh, that talks about the importance of translation and the significant power it has in a place, which I also studied in my undergraduate as well. So that's the symbol. So lastly, I'm going to talk about the What Does Irishness Look Like video, which I produced and directed last year. and uh, went viral last summer. I released it in July on YouTube and other platforms. And why did I include the Irish language in this video documentary? I see the Irish language as part of the identity conversation. 
I see it as very central in Irish life and society and culture, and I see it as part of Irish identity. Showcasing Ireland's rich diversity and a hope for a more inclusive society. We talk a lot about diversity, but I think we should aim more to be inclusive rather than diverse, in the sense that we should include all kinds of people in our discussions, in our media, everywhere we can. And there's no way, one way to look Irish in today's Ireland. Um, 2019 Ireland is so diverse, as you were talking about, Francesca. And it's something to be celebrated rather than to be scared of. And I think we should also be mindful of the language we use to communicate with people who we think are different to us. That question, where are you really from? Myself and Francesca were discussing this earlier. It's, I know a lot of people feel that it's a harmless question, but for people like myself that grew up here, but do have another heritage, there's no one way to really answer that question because, you know, even for myself, you know, I was born in Lagos, Nigeria, but I came here when I was seven months old. I've been living here all my life, so, you know, I can't answer that in one way. Usually when people ask me where I'm from, I just say Dublin because this is where I grew up all my life. But, you know, if you're kind and respectful, then I will give you that knowledge of my history, you know. It's not something that's just so easy to answer. And a lot, for a lot of people that, you know, come here to a new country, you know, not everyone's journey is an easy journey to tell. My parents came here as asylum seekers. I might not want to share that story with everyone. So you have to be mindful about the questions you ask people. So I'm going to show the video now. And I hope you enjoy it. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. It's Aaron Achme. Oh, this is Aaron Achme impression. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. It's Aaron Achme. But you mightn't guess it the first time that you talk to me. One of the first things they'll ask me is where I'm from. And one of the second things they'll ask me is, no, where am I really from? And it, it's, I'm sure it's perfectly innocent, but I'm Irish. It's, uh, it's, it's as simple as that. I guess when someone of colour asks me where I'm from, I would say Irish and they'd be like, cool, me too, Tala, where are you from? But when it's someone who's Irish, <laughs> it kind of, you feel like there's an undertone of something else. I get a quizzical look, a raised eyebrow, and they say, but you don't look Irish. And what they mean by that is, I don't look white. Saying I'm Irish is never good enough. I grew up in Dublin, but I always felt like I, I was Irish, but now and again I'm reminded that I don't look it. I remember it really vividly. Um, I had a crush on a guy, and he told my friends that, that he wasn't interested in me because I was a chink. I mean, even in primary school, growing up, people would be like, why do you want to come here and ask weird questions like that? I've read that, I have to accept the fact that I am Nigerian, and that is my history, that's my ancestry. I'm also Irish because this is where I've grown up. It's your first day of college and you're the only like person of colour there and your tutor's like, oh, uh, Karen, Karen, sorry, uh, where, where are you from? Since we're all getting to know each other here, where, where are you from? I'm Irish. Uh, where, where, um, kind of everyone's looking around you and it's awkward and you're like, oh, you want to know how am I like, you know, so beautifully caramel. Um, you know, in saying that, I know a lot of people who are white would probably be like, oh, well, it's like PC politics gone mad, and um, you know, you can't even ask people where they're from these days without like offending them. It's like, well, I mean, it depends on how you ask it. People almost like, um, like see me as like, oh, she's exotic, she's Asian. It used to bother me an awful lot, but I started to understand that maybe some people might be ignorant or they're just not used to seeing people from a different cultural background who are Irish. I'm Irish but my parents are Chinese and that's the end of that. My mom has more stories than she can even remember of people coming up to her and saying like, oh what a beautiful baby you have. You have a heart of gold for taking one of them in, you know, 
like seeing on the telly, it's so sad. And she would try to like convince them that this was her actual daughter and people just didn't seem, <laughs> people just didn't seem to believe her. A lot of the racism that happens here seems to be from people who genuinely believe that they mean well. Like these wee grannies who would talk to me at the bus stop and they would compliment me and they were so kind about how good my English was. Born and adopted from Romania, I'm Irish. I used to work in a restaurant and people would ask me uh, every time I'd serve them where I was from. When I say I'm from down the road, from Dublin or from Ireland, the disbelief from people's eyes kills me. And it got to the point where if they said a country, say Italy, I would actually just agree with them just to make them stop talking. I guess we call them microaggressions. It's like a mosquito bite, you know? If you get one, it's not a big deal. It's annoying, but you move on. But when you're constantly just swarmed by them and they're buzzing in your ears and they're pinching you all over, it's just, it's maddening. And at that point, where are you from from starts sounding like where are you supposed to be instead? What I am is an Irish woman of Nigerian heritage. This is my face, this is my skin, and it's me, I'm Irish. Is there enough me? Ni korga mek ain me no the test solution. Ak no akurtum and kesh, where are you from, Erm? Ni fragrium like carvos me thing. I am Irish. That shouldn't be questioned. But I am also Pakistani. And I am proof that you can be both. I think right off the bat, the first thing people think when I tell them that I'm Irish is how could she possibly be Irish when she's also black? And I think the fact that we have these notions of what Irishness is meant to be is pretty, it's pretty ridiculous. It is possible to have this duality within you, you know, I am Irish, but I'm also a person, a person of colour and you know, there are people who don't accept that, you know, that's their own problem. You look like you're from Nigeria, you live in Ireland, you sound a bit American, and then you know all these like hodgepodges of identity. It's this weird thing of identity being like this melting pot. What What's the look of a nation versus the look of a country? I've lived in Ireland for 14 years and I identify as Afro-Irish. I think when it comes to identity, it's so much more like what you perceive yourself to be and how you see it as opposed to other people. Being called Irish, being perceived myself as Irish, something I take with pride, is a place I want to represent. You are where you where you call home, where you consider home. Anything else is just, you know, loud white noise. Growing up, I grew up as an Irish person. I grew up with the Irish culture, the Irish food, the Irish music, and I studied Irish in school, but then to know people are attacking me for not being Irish as a child, I just couldn't understand that. You know, I didn't do five years of honors Irish for some crap on Twitter to tell me <laughs> that, you know, I'm not as much a part of this country as anyone else is. You know, I've seen Cockabillish and You May Gazano done more times than any person is supposed to. So I'm good Irish, like, and that's it. Being Irish is not only a color of skin, it's not only a color of hair, it's not only a color of eyes. It's culture. Uh, this is Ireland and, and I'm Irish. So I... languages I'm familiar with now I'll say bye and thank you with three languages I'm familiar with Oshé Gonk Magi and thank you to open uh, the discussion to the, uh, the floor, um, so uh, if you have any comments, uh, questions, the only thing I would ask for is, is, is privacy. Right? Um, but uh, once you observe that ground rule, uh, we're open to uh, any question or, or comment. Would you like to start?
Oh. Also. Um, what I'm interested in is terms of ownership of language. How much ownership are you allowed to have of Irish? Do people treat you like you're a freak? You know, it's it's not... I, I've seen uh, the, the videos as well. So the more exotic you are speaking Irish, the more attention you get. A white person speaking Irish doesn't seem to cause any interest. But if you're black or you're Japanese or you're Chinese, how much ownership do you think you're allowed to have of Irish? Yeah, that's a difficult question because I definitely feel like not everyone is happy that I speak Irish. You know, as I was growing up, people did question why I spoke Irish. You know, they questioned my parents as well. Even my mom was uh, told by someone before, like, oh, I'm taking the place of an actual Irish person in Irish school. So not everyone's happy. And even a while ago on Twitter, a troll said that I'm hijacking the Irish language. I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I don't know if it's particularly to do with the Irish language, maybe it's, it could be with any other language, but I think it's because of how we really view Ireland that that's why people find it strange that I speak Irish, because, I mean, look at French, for example, anyone speaks that, black people speak that, white people speak that, but for some reason with Irish it's a bit different, and there is a politics to do with Irish, you know, not, like, it happens even with white Irish speakers that they get questioned a lot and they're always attacked really like even Blonde Lee Cuffey said she was called a cultural terrorist <coughs> before on Twitter so yeah it's it's definitely it's definitely a struggle to be an Irish speaker in Ireland definitely and especially black Irish speakers as well yeah. Two thousand and eight was the European Year of Intercultural Dialogue at the European Commission. In that year, published a green paper on migration and mobility challenges for EU education systems, which you may have come across. In it, it essentially tasked all EU member states to a uh, promote the host language uh, of the country and b to also promote the heritage languages where people are from, as, as you were saying, Francesca, earlier on. So the question is, how well do you think at the macro level or also in the education system, for example, Ireland is doing on that front, given that countries balance or strike that balance in very different ways? And if you come to the conclusion, that's my second question related to it, that Ireland is not doing so well on that front, what could be done to improve this? I'm thinking, for example, about bonus points for taking out languages, given that percentages are quite low in Ireland, or allowing the option of uh, sitting exams in heritage languages, a la UK, for example? I certainly think with... Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, I certainly think, firstly, we need to differentiate maybe between primary schools, maybe even early years education, primary schools and post-primary schools. And... Uh, what, what I have observed through, through research examinations of this is that certain primary schools are working very well in certain areas of this, maybe because primary school teachers, in addition to being teachers of subjects, are also teachers of language, being adapted to teaching Irish and English, and understanding maybe what goes with it in terms of teaching linguistic skills. Um, the availability of specific posts for English language support within our primary schools and our post-primary schools is still something that is helping with regard to English language skills and it's very often talked about as language support so you have a language support teacher in the school but you don't you have an English language support teacher and the language of that is important. Um, when it comes to post-primary what I have seen through the literature is a difficulty for some teachers to understand not just the teaching of the language, that they're not just teaching a subject, but also teaching the language of the subject. And there's a skill that goes with that. So that's the first bit with regard to teaching and developing English language skills. Um, I'm not sure if anybody in the room has experience of that, but just that notion of not just teaching a subject, but teaching the language of the subject is important. Providing points, I'm, I'm, I'm always worried that assessment becomes a tail that wags the dog at, at a curriculum level. So if you put everything into a reward system or something like that, but then that, does that shift the curriculum content? Or are there better ways of, of doing that? Like Francesca's work with Mother Tongue's work, like um, 
dual or, or, or trilingual uh, language books, uh, uh, competitions and, 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 and stimuli like that, that actually encourage the embedding of a culture that is respectful of the language within a school. And I think that outside of the, so, so certain children will do well if we test through certain languages and give, or give points, but it is more about shifting the culture to understand that all teachers understand the importance of helping children to develop whatever linguistic capacities they have. So I'm a little bit nervous of the, the points argument. I think we know what happens. That skews where people and, and the emphasis that people, people um, uh, kind of put their energies into then. It, it may be part of the, of the puzzle, um, but I'm not, sure it's, I'm not sure it's the full fit. Sorry, not if that's helpful. Or, uh, um, he asked a lot of questions in one question, <laughs> uh, and one is about the heritage languages, so um, it is in development, so we'll see what happens, but it is possible for <coughs> secondary school students to sit exams in Polish and Romanian, uh, sorry, in, um, in Portuguese, uh, but it's so new that Lithuanian, you need to see also, um, the, here heritage language means that the parents have done the work before, mm. so if the parents being supported in in continuing to speak, but also to develop literacy in the heritage languages, mm. and then how does that translate into their children's knowledge, and how does that translate into the exam results, and so mm. on and so forth? So that's uh, still a question, I think, because it's so new. Uh, in terms of earlier uh, learning, so primary school, there is the primary language curriculum, which has um, a lot of suggestions for teachers to uh, promote the use of the home languages, to uh, use them in, the, in their classes, in the activities that they do. So it, again, it's something that we need to see in action uh, still. It, it's new, it's relatively new, and it's done well. In the, I see, uh, I've visited some teacher training colleges, and there is training for new uh, students who will become teachers. So it's a matter of seeing how the cycle will go, but it's positive, I think. Yeah, if I just come in on that, I think there was a, a bit of a missed opportunity with the Language Connect, the, the, the language policy, which, you know, <coughs> just looks at, at, at language at, at second level. I mean, mm -hmm. the, 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 it's a pity that there wasn't a kind of joined up thinking where you look at language uh, acquisition from your first, second, and third level to con consider as a kind of continuum. Mm -hmm. um, because we've, you know, we've got a crisis in terms of, you know, the number of students who've taken uh, languages at, at, at third level, there was the kind of the ending of the primary. Uh, school Modern Languages Initiative um, that was you know, cost of a mere, it was, it was five million euro and it was, it was got rid of them, which you know, hasn't been reinstated. So, they, what, so there's a kind of, um, so the Language Connect Initiative is, is a very laudable one, um, but the difficulty is that they, they, the connection is not, they're not looking at the kind of language continuum um, through, through, through life. It's been seen as kind of discrete units, which I think is not a very useful way of looking at language. And I would add early childhood within that yeah, as well. So as we formalise early childhood education, that has to be part of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Hello, talking about concrete steps, I was just wondering whether you would recommend teaching a third language in the primary school or perhaps have a module like Language Explorers that Tefa just developed, something that would actually welcome children who are speakers of other languages than Irish and English and will include and celebrate diversity as well? Both. Let's do everything. I mean, <laughs> but, um, but the argument will always be, but it's already a heavy curriculum. And so you, you kind of have to balance some whether you would teach foreign languages in the primary. That's the question. Um, whether you would teach foreign languages in the primary or have as an introduction to language step. awareness. Language awareness. I would teach languages only if they were taught really well. And if it's a waste of time, if it's just a simple exercise of learning phrases, I wouldn't really, like I'd like to see children have a good experience of language, which makes them want to learn more in secondary and university and you know, to see the opportunities that language gives. If languages are taught badly in primary, they're gonna put off children from wanting to learn more. And this has been done in some cases, even in Irish, where children feel I'm not very good at this. 
And that makes them stop to want to be good language learners when they are, because children are naturally, you know, fantastic learners of everything. But they still, I would have an eight-year-old who says, I'm not good at Irish, but he's good at Italian, so how can you not be good at Irish? And you, we, you, you and me probably know why he feels so unable to use Irish. Um, it's how it's taught. So if a language is taught properly, or it's taught in a way that allows children to learn it by being immersed in it, by being taught through the language maybe, then I would really welcome learning an additional foreign language in school, as well as Irish, taught wonderfully. Yeah, I probably feel like it would be very helpful for children to start with languages from a very young age, so that it would be taught in primary school. Because I think when you start from a young age with a language, then you kind of build yourself up and you get better and better at it. Like for myself, you know, going to an all Irish primary school that really helped me with language. I don't think I would have gone to an all Irish secondary school if I didn't go to an all Irish primary school. But like the case is different for everyone. But I'd definitely say like getting children used to different kinds of languages from a young age is definitely very helpful. I'm always. Part of my work, and I'm very lucky to, to have this as part of my work, which is going into a, a number of schools on, on school placement visits. So we go in and observe our student teachers when they're out in schools, and we meet them very often. So they would go out on observations and come back in, and they're observations of the class that they're going to have, very often from a deficit point of view. But when you ask them, uh, uh, when you get into curricular knowledge, they would talk about Irish, and it's very often with a surprise, either that the class is better <laughs> with, with, with Irish than they thought, and if that's the case, they're probably going into a school that is in some area experiencing socioeconomic uh, uh, inequalities, or that the class is worse at Irish than they would have thought. So there is an expectation that they're going out with an expectation of the level of Irish. And very often, it's, it's, it's one thing I always kind of reflect on, they, they come back, oh, they're better or worse at Irish. So they have an expectation of where that, that class is, is, is going to be. The issue about teaching languages, uh, part with, with one of my hats I work as a coordinator of a migrant teacher project, which is working with immigrant teachers who are now currently living in Ireland, trying to get into the system. And um, within that, we, you know, we've got maybe 670 migrant teachers now in Ireland on our books, and you know, people at various different stages of getting registered with the teaching council. Um, who have huge linguist, sorry, some of them have huge linguistic resources are finding it very, very difficult to find a foothold in how they would move into being a teacher in Ireland. No, some of them are trained language teachers who, who could contribute. And some of them aren't and don't want to be the, you know, just the, the parenthetic French teacher who's going to go from school to school and maybe have a good uh, uh, um, experience or not. But I think there is potential there, there is a resource there if we were to really look at it. Um, but again, what we find with people who aren't fully within the system is that they're Terms and conditions are poor. Um, you know, moving from school to school—it's a very kind of precarious living, and, and you get a very bad sense of you as a professional when you've worked for twenty years somewhere else and come to Ireland, and maybe been a head teacher somewhere else, and maybe even been a inspector somewhere, else, and come into a system that doesn't really recognise your your skill set. So there's a lot to be done on that in terms of a, a linguistic resource that's there, but it's not really being kind of ex explored. Right? question was about also our language awareness that can continue to be built into everything that the children do on a daily basis and then language learning is part of the curriculum then as a separate thing but definitely language awareness can is something that children already have it needs to be fostered from the very beginning early years and can continue until the end of school With extreme respect, I think the attitudes to language might be more complex. And I meet people from, from Belgium quite a lot. In Belgium, like here, they are learning two languages. The languages are Dutch and French. Not Vlamsk and Vallon, Dutch and French. And ten years after leaving school, they do not speak the other language. 
and the antipathy towards that other language is far greater than they have ever found in Ireland towards Irish. In Switzerland, they learn two languages. The other language is always either German or French, and it's Hochdeutsch, not Deutsch. They never learn Italian at all, and never, ever, 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 ever learn the one unique Swiss language, Flemish. So that I have yet to meet a Swiss person who answered me when I said, to go to them. That's hello in Flemish. So not alone is your, your attitude to your own language one of extreme possession, your attitude to other languages is often one of extreme rejection, and to speakers of that language. And I wonder, might people react to that? Thank you. Well, I think every country has a history, and every person also grows up with a certain attitude. And it com could come from your family, how they feel about others, how they feel about that language. My parents spoke a dialect, an Italian dialect, and my dad wanted me to know this dialect. And my mom said, don't ever speak that dialect. And it's how they were raised and how they perceive the prestige of that dialect. So the history of a country tells you a lot about how people feel also about the language, but it's also very, very personal. It's a very personal experience. And uh, the otherness is very much something that concerns, um, well, multilingual places, and also places like Switzerland, where they look down on a certain speaker of a language, but there's historic reasons for that, there's social reasons for that. Uh, but we, we find that even here. Um, in the class, there's children who say, oh, I don't want you to speak that strange thing. And it's the fear of something that is different and they don't know. So there's a lot of reasons for feeling strongly about language. So yeah, it's something that we could debate all night about, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Francesca. It is very personal. It depends, like, on the family as well. Like, I know for myself in my family that my parents really made sure that I understood Yoruba, and not every maybe Nigerian parent would want to do that. So it, it is really different. And regards to how we were talking about how Irish is being taught in schools, I really think that we should start placing emphasis on speaking the language rather than the grammar because grammar scares children. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is very difficult. So I really feel like if we start placing emphasis on just speaking the language to one another, regardless if you get your grammar wrong or not, or right, you know, I still get my grammar in Irish wrong sometimes. So, you know, it's a human thing. So I think we should sometimes not be so precious about it. Yeah, one yeah, wonders really if they uh, struck me in a, a number of comments that people made. Um, as to why they decided to move to Ireland. Um, one particular um, Englishman in his mid-50s was talking about the fact he was speaking to a client in, in Russian, a tube in London, mm -hmm. and, and somebody started you know, kind of barking at him and said, you know, this is why we voted for, for Brexit, so we don't need to put up with the likes of you. Uh, so if they, 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 and it's, it, it comes up in a lot of the commentary um, around you know, people's reasons for voting and to, to, to leave, that very often language was used as the kind of vector, the, 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 the symbol of that kind of unacceptable otherness. You know? um, and um, it's, it's, it's interesting how that kind of, I think they call it glossophobia, but I mean, you know, the way in which language can get instrumentalized in, in particular kinds of debates, you know, which is, is all around exclusion and, and rejection. But some people have power over that, so I've also heard that story in the context of people speaking Welsh on a train <laughs> and being accosted. And yeah, this is why we, yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. yes, you have Jacob Brees-Mogg tweeting in Latin. Yes, yeah. So he has the power to tweet in Latin, yeah. whereas you know, so, so that language diversity. But I think the difference in somebody rejecting a language later on and somebody getting the message to reject their language quite early is really important because we know when children get that message very early on that actually they're losing the capacity to actually learn from one language to another and sometimes fall between the stools. So it's not directly answering maybe the question of the broader politics of the language, but the discourse around the importance of uh, you know prizing it, uh, making it normal, certainly within a society, is, is that it encourages that and it doesn't happen that. And, a recent ENAR report, the European Network Against Racism, has a piece where in an NGO, a Polish speaker was asked to leave the waiting room because he took a phone call in Polish. 
and that type of that type of attitude that really doesn't set people thinking this is okay. I don't want to bring you away from what seemed to be the parameter of the evening, but I'm fascinated by identity, by all those young people that you had in the video who said they were Irish. And I wonder, is it the language, acquiring the language, that has given them that feeling? Because I came here first labelled an alien, and then I became an immigrant, and English is my second language, and Gaelic was my third and I did more, and I believe in multilingualism, but I'm not Irish. And I was very taken aback by how the identity of Irishness was absorbed by these young people in a way that I have never felt that, although I've lived in this society all my life. Mm -hmm. So I wonder <coughs> if the language that you feel made that difference. And uh, when you said language, you mean the Irish language? Well, Irish and acquiring English, I know you spoke English, but some of those young people in the video would not have known English in their childhood. Um, no, I believe that all of them did grow up with English. Yeah. Ah. Most of them were probably even born here. Yeah, yes. So I believe that probably yes. have English. Some of them even had Irish as well, as we mm -hmm. could see in the video. Mm. But yeah, I do feel that people have a perception that if you're not white and you're living here, that you don't understand English. Like I remember being asked, oh, or be, being said to me, oh, you have good English. And I just find that just like, what, what? Like, because first of all, I'm from a Nigerian heritage. Nigerian official language is English. And second of all, I grew up here. So I just find that very complex, just quite strange that you just assume yes. looking at someone yes. that they don't understand yeah. English. And also, if you don't have fluent English, that doesn't mean you're not intelligent. I mean, there's so many different languages in this world. So why is it that we put English on a pedestal and say, oh, if you don't understand that English, then you're not educated. I think that's completely ridiculous. So I think our mindset needs to change. And yeah, as I was saying, I don't believe it's to do with uh, the Irish language or English in the video. It's more about the look of the person. And that's what I was really trying to tackle in the video that we see a person and we think that because that person looks a particular way that they're not Irish. It's more to do with the look rather than the speech, I think. Thank you. Can I just follow up on what English in Nigeria? Um, I, I talk that apart from the colonial heritage, it's also uh, the official language because of so many other languages. You know, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm more interested in uh, you know, to what extent there's pressure put on young people to learn English and forget their native language. Um, is, is it uh, a reflection of um, <coughs> that, the, you know, the national attempt to uh, be a player in the globalized world on the one hand, or are, are young people actually ambitious, uh, dying to uh, leave their country, or, or at least to succeed in a globalized world within their country? It, 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 to me, it sort of um, slightly uh, connects with the big issue that uh, European politics has made of uh, uh, immigration and uh, uh, the uh, suggestions that one can somehow halt immigration by uh, economic support to, say, African countries and so on, on a huge scale. But it, it, it is, is some connection there? Or is, is, is a, a, a kind of a, um, desire by young Nigerians, say, to uh, uh, forget their own language in order to somehow become more important in a globalized world? Um, I wouldn't say it's just with young Nigerians. I would say it's by any really country that has been colonized, really, uh, to kind of live up to, I suppose, the culture of the colonizer. Um, 
I feel like, yeah, as I was saying that, you know, people feel like it's more civilized to, you know, be westernized or to speak English. But that again, you know, comes from the colonized mindset. And that's why I was talking about, you know, decolonization and Dubu Watianga. So it's something to do <coughs> within yourself and the society you're living in as well. I think Nigeria as a country is always, you know, trying to be maybe like America instead of, you know, being proud of what it is, its culture, the rich culture, you know, I feel it's the same with anywhere, like even, you know, here in Ireland, you know, people feel like, oh, if you've gone to London, oh, they're doing really well, you know, they're doing better. And it's just like, why, why is it that they're doing better in London? They can do well here as well. And obviously there's many reasons why people, you know, emigrate, but, you know, you can do well in your own home country as well. Like, it's, you know, I think we put so much emphasis on, you know, going abroad and, you know, that's where the better life is. But sometimes it isn't, you know, as someone from an immigrant background, I can say, you know, I've gone through a lot of struggles with my parents and it wasn't easy. But, you know, sometimes you have to go to another country reluctantly. Uh, mostly people don't want to. So, yeah, I suppose people do try live up to a certain um, certain idea just to make themselves, you know, be in a better position. But I think that's to do with the society we live in. And I think we should start kind of breaking that down and thinking differently, I suppose. Thanks. Uh, can you have time for just one more question and then we'll just wrap up? I'd just like to ask if you have any information on the maintenance of the languages, the heritage languages, students of migrant background, and how it, how well it can be maintained and what impact that might have, particularly in a positive way, on how they perform, let's say, in the junior certificate or that senior cycle. And where it has been doing well in the PISA studies, and can we give credit also to the fact that there are people with language repertoires who, who I've got language sensitive competences and transfer competences and so on, and can do well. We saw some years ago, for example, with PISA in Germany, when scores weren't so good, they blamed the migrant population. And then we saw another project where, for foreign languages in Germany, the best results were had by those from migrant backgrounds. Mm. Uh, it's always a bit complex, but if you want to convince <coughs> people who make policy and decide how the money is spent, if there's any interesting data that reinforces the benefit of developing the confidence in the first language or languages, especially in reading, because we know what an indicator that can be from comments and others. Thank you. Yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm always nervous to start off with PISA as a mark of where we're at. I, I understand the importance of it, but really we're not competing on, on equal footing well and we know that in terms of hot housing in, in countries where that do really well so um, I suppose we shouldn't necessarily although we have done 2011 radically shifted our curriculum on the basis of a piece of, of a piece of score so it does it does count what counts counts is um, uh, there there is I suppose, uh, as you know from quoting comments there there is very strong evidence of that interdependence across across languages, and certainly, um, we've spoken about in terms of the practices within primary schools that do support that and do push that on. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I understood that element of, of your question. Are you are you looking for specific evidence that specific language groups help our scores or? Precise. Okay. Uh, in the sense that I, I just suspect that at some point the data will be useful from mm -hmm. policy making, and uh, if you can, in some way, illustrate how those who, for whom the first language was not English or Irish, that they have been able to develop what you yourself yeah. referred to earlier as the the kind of competence, the discourse and the genre that they need to acquire to succeed at school. And they've done this very well. And is there a link there also with maintaining 
the language of the whole of the of the first language. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing we have to bring into this in the context of, our, of migration into Ireland and the languages that come in is the, is the class and the material inequalities that certain languages coalesce around our migrant groups that allow certain migrant groups to keep the language and perform quite well because they have the resources to buy that in that aren't provided by the school and others where either the, the society downplays it. So, you know, if, if you have Romance language that can kind of come across into either the French, is French or, or the Italians or that, um, or those that are either Yoruba or, or, or those that really don't have that standing. But I'm not aware of, certainly not in the Irish context, of evidence that maps the kind of, I suppose we don't have a testing regime of it, that actually maps how certain kids have managed to keep their language and what that means in the context of their performance at junior cert or, and or leaving cert or, or on thesis. So. And one thing I'd say is also that a lot of heritage language research is with young children. Mm. So there's quite a lot on early years, like preschool children, how they maintain the language in primary, but there's really very little on the, the longer, you know, maintenance over 18 years of children's life or, you know, pupils' life. And I think there is research from Canada uh, showing that uh, children who've given up the L1 in favor of the L2 are not faring better by having given up, up the L1, and mm -hmm. these are second language learners. Mm -hmm. But again, this is research from Canada, it's a completely different setting, uh, even though English is the language they're looking at. Um, but yeah, there could be more in, you know, to support, as you're saying, some data to support the fact that keeping up two languages is beneficial. So it seems like an excellent idea for research project. There we go. <laughs> in the so um, I think I'd like to uh, well first I'd like to thank you uh, all for turning up uh, this evening um, to to take part in this discussion, take part in the debate, uh, and on, on your behalf, on on behalf of uh, Danny Haas and Tom uh, Walker, I'd like to thank uh, our three speakers uh, this evening, uh, Francesca, uh, Rory, and uh, Ola, for an extremely, I think. Um, subtle, uh, complex, uh, informative uh, and stimulating uh, presentation uh, on uh, the, this new polyglot city that is, is coming into to, to being and that whereas before I think there's been a, a great deal of, of emphasis, you know, partly the kind of Joyce in case and what you might call uh, elite uh, multilingualism and um, now which is in many ways infinitely more interesting is what you might term vernacular uh, multilingualism which is the kind of the, the comp, yeah, the, 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 this language diversity uh, from below, uh, which is becoming so evident uh, in, in our lives. So, uh, once again, without further ado, I'd like to thank you for taking part in this debate.